Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ricky Tug with the University of Florida, and it is my pleasure to say hello to everyone here for the uh, this next to the last uh, Society of Agricultural Communication Scholars webinars. And today we have with us Kisto Settle, Audrey King, and Laurie Baker, who will be talking uh, on this topic, the field's expectations for agricultural communications master's programs. As we usually do this, uh, we'll have, have them do their presentation. Uh, we've already spoken and they would like to hold questions until the end. Um, and so there'll be time for us to, to share our thoughts and comments and questions with the presentation group. Uh, and then if there is any time at the end of the Q&A period, we'll also have some time to talk about anything that's on your minds, whether it's uh, you know positions open or whatever else as we get close to the end of the semester. So with that, so I'm going to turn it on over to Kisto, Audrey, and to Lori. Thanks so much. Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone. I was voluntold as tribute, so I get to start us off today, and we will be talking about the field's expectations for agricultural communications master's programs. If you don't know me, hi, I'm Andre King. I'm an assistant professor of agricultural communications at Oklahoma State University, and this is kind of cool for me today. Um, because I get to present with both of my um, advisors from my graduate work. So Dr. Kiso Settle was my advisor in my PhD program. And then Laurie Baker is, uh, was my advisor in uh, my master's program. So if you're looking for anyone to blame for my existence within this discipline, it's their fault. Um, and we're excited to talk to you about this project today. So um, agricultural communications. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but it's kind of a thing. Um, those are all animated keys, so there you go. Great. Um, perhaps you've heard of it. Hopefully you have. Um, this discipline was born out of service units at land-grant institutions, right? So our predecessors from um, the Smith-Lieber Act had funds not only for extension, but also for this idea of creating publications and things surrounding this, which is this idea of ag editors, which is where our discipline comes from. The idea, um, and many of us, all of us on the call, are um, involved in preparing these students to work in journalism, public relations, member organizations, doing design, writing, those sorts of things, motivated communication, um, and that's kind of what agricultural communications itself looks like. And as we all likely know um, on this call, our undergraduate programs have been um, kind of our bread and butter for a very long time. As um, we are born out of service units, uh, we have taken a lot of time to ask many people what they think about what undergraduate programs should and should not be, uh, whether that's the social skills that students should have, perhaps it's um, the technical skills, the number of programs that are around, all those sorts of things um, have been studied very extensively from lots of points of view, from academics points of view, from students points of view, and from practitioners points of view. However, um, master's programs really just haven't been studied with that much ferocity. Uh, and that's really where uh, the three of us come in. We um, hatch this idea, and by we, I do mean Kisto, I believe, hatch this idea of let's let's talk about and think about the kind of skills, um, the kind of courses and those um, sorts of things that our master students, uh, what we think they should and should not have. So that's the study um, that we're going to talk to you about today. And now Kiso is going to tell you all about how we got it done. And so we did a modified Delphi um, in you all hopefully should have received uh, an invite to this, but basically it was populated by the SACS list, but we also checked it to make sure to see if there's anyone missing. Um, basically we have about 86 that we, not 86, we had 86 that we initially invited. Um, it kind of drops a little bit because we did have a couple of folks opt out after the initial round. Um, but basically we, we wanted to have all of the ag com faculty giving input because even though not all are at master's programs, they all went through master's programs. They would all have, uh, expertise you'd want to have. So round one, we're just looking open-ended at skills, courses, and theories that they think should be a part of master's programs. Uh, 86 invited, 30 completed. Round two, we then go to throwing them all out there. And do you think this should be required, optional, excluded, or do you not know 
about this course, this theory, or this uh, specific skill. And then also an open-ended item in case we missed anything from round one. And so that had a couple things that we then sent out with round, round three. Round three, basically right down to the required or not required. So no more wiggle room, just full on. Do you think that this should be required as a part of it? Invited 81, uh, 27 completed. So pretty consistent response rate throughout. So not the highest response rate in the world, but when you're sending folks emails in a busy semester, this is pretty good for faculty. Um, as much as possible, we did try to keep the phrasing wording as close to what y'all had. Um, so this is where this did get noted in some of the responses, but there are some items that are going to be fairly similar to each other. And we did note that like something we noticed too, but if there was any argument that these two things were not the same thing, we kept them separate. So like there's a functional idea of like functionality of you're probably not going to have an ad com theory class and a com theory class. But at the end of the day, you could argue that those are still two separate things. So we did keep them separate from each other. Um, so as we look at round one, uh, just basically everything that y'all throw at us, we have 65 different theories, 19 communication skills courses, 13 strategy related courses, 12 research related courses, 10 history and perspective courses, seven theory courses, and five communication application uh, skills we start to uh, multiply even more. So 24 related to professional professionalism and management, 19 related to research, 17 related to strategy and problem solving, 15 technology, seven that were just kind of this broader ag and natural resources or other, uh, six um, that were theory specific, and then 31 that were just generally related to communication. So from round one, we then have round two where we show you all all of those items. And I'm not showing you all those items because they will not fit on a PowerPoint screen. Um, and even what I'm about to show you is still going to be too much. But from round two, we then um, we looked at a threshold of to move on to round three, they need to have at least 50% said that something should be required. That then gave us 22 courses, 32 theories and 77 skills. So what you're about to see are all the ones that were evaluated on round three. So we get a nice round number of 10 courses that hit 80% agree. So 50% from round two to get to the 80% threshold of agreement. So this 80% is the round three evaluation of those items. And so these are the 10 that met the 80% threshold. We still have the remaining, what was it, out of 14 others that don't meet that threshold. But number one is AgCom theory. But kind of like we talked about earlier where you have the split, um, you have number one ad comm theory and number six communication theory. So a funk, you're probably not going to have a, a program that's going to have both, but just so that you have those items you can choose them. So ad comm theory, research methods, uh, research writing course, statistics, data analysis and presentation, comm theory, data analysis. Um, and again, this is another one of those. We're splitting it out because data presentation and data analysis aren't necessarily the same thing. Uh, thesis and capstone course, agricultural communications foundation, and then data analytics. Um, for the theories that met the 80% thre threshold, we have 13. Uh, if you want to do a screenshot, that might be the easiest way for you all to get some of these. Um, I can still read these off, but the skills is going to be a little too much. But agenda setting, framing, uh, uses and gratifications, those are pretty core foundational courses. And then you start to see some stuff that we tend to can be specific to add comm, theory of planned behavior, diffusion of innovations. You have source credibility, media dependency, gatekeeping, social cognitive theories, uh, situational crisis comm theory, select activity process, exposure, attention, perception, retention, recall, uh, social marketing and elaboration, likelihood model. Um, and again, phrasing as much as possible is kept as originally written down in the very first round. Um, and then the skills. I am not reading y'all all these skills. So if you like these skills, you want to see all these skills, please take a screenshot. If you don't know how to take a screenshot, grab your cell phone. Um, I believe that it's command shift four on a Mac if you need that. Um, but you can kind of just see that it's a wide variety of things, but a lot of it's going to focus on like the communication theory, the communication process and the research. You do still have some kind of just basic writing skills. Like you do see APA style as a part of this um, in writing in general, but this is going to be fun for us to sort later on when we have to kind of put in a little bit more of a manageable version, but these kind of the too long didn't read version of this is these are 40 different skills that at least 80% of uh, respondents all agreed. And they are in order. So uh, the critical thinking is number one, the survey down there would be down around 80%. But that's still four out of five people that responded to this. And as most of you know, getting 
the majority of faculty to agree on anything. We can't even agree if we're ag communications or communication. So to get 80%, I think is a pretty big deal. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Baker. Yes, um, I'm just going to summarize a little bit all the things he said and then um, give you some highlights of what our next steps are um, related to this. So in summary, courses, we were fairly consistent to build an approximately 30 hour master's program. Again, maybe we would push and pull some of those to um, to courses that were similar. Our theories varied quite a bit in their importance. And as we went along, the skills varied a lot, um, which you definitely saw in those pieces. But essentially, so what, right? <laughs> does it does it matter that we did any of this really? Um, well, I think it does matter or we wouldn't have done it, right? Um, as much as our undergrad program had been studied, um, this is really the first time we've done much quantifying at the master's level of what we have available in our discipline. And so we're hoping to build on this further. Um, we like the fact that there were diversity in thought related to what should be in an AgCom MS program. And I will point out here that even though all three of us would have technically fallen in this sampling frame. We did not participate. Um, I think that seems like it might be obvious, but I did want to explicitly say that. So there were times when we looked at that and were like, oh, well, I would have had this up here or I would have had that up there. And you know, we weren't allowed to insert those along the way. Um, but I do think that it was interesting to see that while Keisto pointed out we did have 80% agreement of the final things we presented in round three today, um, we kind of like the fact that at the master's level, maybe there's a little more variability than at the undergraduate level. And that could allow each program to specialize and match their faculty's expertise, um, maybe even match regional needs um, related to graduate programs um, or become known for something in particular or something unique or different. So um, we thought that piece was pretty interesting. What are we gonna do next? So where do we go from here? What our team is gonna do is conduct more analysis on this, um, write up the results. Our plan is to hopefully publish this in Jack so that you will be able to cite it. Um, one of our original needs was um, working on a proposal that Garrett and I are working on. I don't see others for sure is, you know, as we were writing up details on what should be in science communication curriculum for this grant, we were like, huh, we literally have nothing to cite. So this will be a citable piece, we're hoping, um, as we're working to further develop our, our graduate education. So these are what we for sure have planned. And then on the next slide, I have some things we were thinking about, but we would love to hear from y'all about um, how this would be valuable or helpful to you. So as we continue our adventure, um, quantifying how many master's programs there were, um, you know, Jeff Miller at all did that with undergraduate programs. And I don't know about y'all, but I've cited that a lot. <laughs> when I'm talking to people, when I'm writing things, it's been very helpful. There could be some limitation in our current data set and we'd have to decide um, how to fix that. Um, there's at least one program on the surface that we know didn't have any faculty answer the the um, the Delphi. So we would have to maybe find other ways to add that quantifying bit, but that is something we'd like to be able to do. Um, you'll notice the last two, I kind of have a question mark after, um, depending on, on what you think might be valuable. We thought about building perhaps an example program with some pick and chooses, plug and play kind of pieces for this based on the data, um, maybe even comparing the name of programs, um, if that would be helpful for people who were um, starting new programs and thinking about names. Um, and after that, we are open to hear what your ideas are, your thoughts are on things that would be useful for you. So if there's something specific you would find helpful, um, We'd love to open up for questions now. All of our emails are also there. And um, if you think of something later, we'd be happy to follow up with you. All right. 
Open up for questions or comments. I'll jump in and say that that like pick and choose program example would be really helpful in building a program. So I would love that. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> and something we can kind of, I'm going to exit full screen mode, but as we kind of hop back to that um, final grouping of courses, like obviously some of these merge together. And one of the things we talked about um, where Laurie talked about like this, this kind of goes, goes to a 30, degree, 30 hour program. And what, to get a little bit more specific, like you would merge the theory, you would merge all the data st analysis statistics ones. And so essentially you would have like core courses with a bank of like, here are your electives related hours or whatever you want to call those. And it does kind of pretty neatly give us about probably about four, four to five, like where you would have some flexibility for the students too. I'm going to jump in. Um, one other thing that would be really interesting is more information about thesis versus non-thesis tracks in the master's program. Um, so our thesis track is 30 hours, but our non-thesis is 36 hours. And then there are some options for what a student can do for that synthesis of learning, but I'd love to see what others do and establish some best practices. Um, in Lori and others, it, I'd also, we're, we have tremendous growth in our master's program, like more than we can manage. And I'm curious if that's happening in other programs that currently have a master's program. So just looking at the trend a little bit and why I have some theories, they're not on your list, but I have some lay theories about why that growth might be happening, but I'd love to be able to put some data to support that. Jamie, go ahead. Hey, um, thanks for this. I'm at UT Knoxville. Um, I think some of you probably know that, just for others who didn't. Um, our master's program is interdisciplinary. So we have, it's, we don't actually have an MS in AgCom, it's Ag Leadership, Education and Communications. And um, it's 30 hours. Students can take any classes that are available from, across our uh, options is also online, so the courses have to be available online. I guess it'd be interesting to see how common that is, how common it is to have either a adcom only program versus uh, something that's interdisciplinary, and then what are the some statistics around around those like are the are the interdisciplinary ones more popular or vice versa um and it's also a trend that we're carrying into our phd program that we've proposed is that's not going to be concentration specific or your advisor will through your dissertation will guide you through a concentrated research program but the general phd is interdisciplinary too and so my general experience is what I would say is I know that Texas Tech and Oklahoma State have AgCom only master's programs. Uh, there might be some others, but those are the only two that I know off the top of my head. Most that I've seen have been interdisciplinary. We do actually can't put it because it gets a little too close to identifying people, but um, we did ask them, what's the name of your master's program if you have one? Um, and so there was a lot of the split of all of them. So like uh, UFs is going to be Ag Education and Communication. Like that's what my PhD is. Um, I, I forgot that over and over again, that I actually had a PhD in ag education. Um, I don't think anyone wants me bragging about that. Um, but I think that that's, it's an important question. That's a question we kind of wrestled with here at Oklahoma state. Cause at one point we were considering merging the master's programs. They merged the ag leadership and ag education masters, but we kept the ag com program separate at the exact same time that we were naming the PhD program across all three of our disciplines here. So it's kind of, it's a little murky. And one of the interesting things, and there were two faculty at the same institution that disagreed about whether or not they had a master's for ag communication students. Um, like one of them said they did and one said they didn't. And so it gets to this, like what, what counts is not necessarily a clean definition. Because uh, when I was at Mississippi State, ours was ag and extension education. 
And I had this wonderful master student who was focusing on ag communications. And I would have told you like, yeah, you can work on ag communications here, but it wasn't in the name. And so someone else might not have considered that a, an ag communications master's program because it was technically ag and extension education. Anyone else have any other comments or thoughts related to that kind of the overarching degree? Audrey? Well, mine's not related to that. It's related to our presentation, but not to that. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we can go to your comment about the presentation, then we can come back if people have any questions. Great. Um, my co-authors don't know I'm thinking this, so this will be fun for them. But uh, I, like Laurie, have cited the Miller et al. study from 2015 uh, a whole bunch of times. And I was speaking with someone else the other day, and I was like, man, it's been a long time since we've done that study. Should we do it again? And I just wonder if there is, because um, I've seen our colleagues in ag ed, they have some interesting, um, like there's like a whole map with all these locations about where you can be certified to teach ag ed and those sorts of things. Is there a place on the internet that it, we call enough of a home that we could have a list of our programs that perhaps we wouldn't have to repeat an academic study all the time? I don't know if we think that's valuable. Just uh, ideas floating around up here. I don't have an exact answer to that, Audrey, but uh, <laughs> I will say, I feel like even after, like when Jeff presented the his study, like whatever conference that was, I feel like he found out about more while presenting it. And it does feel like it is a real moving target um, related to that piece. Um, so I don't know that I have a solid answer of where that lives, but I think that's also kind of the challenge we have in our next steps is like Keisto pointed out, there's some places of disagreement that we'll have to decide how to handle if multiple people filled out. There's also some gaps where we'll have to maybe do some online searches and some follow-up questions with people to get the answers to, particularly I'm thinking of in response to, to Courtney's question. I don't think we have that data in that way in here, but it, you know, in the big World Wide Web, we might be able to find it and find a way to, to group it together. But I do think this idea of studying ourselves is complicated. And I also find it kind of boring sometimes, but then we go to cite it and we go to talk about it and it is really important. So um, I like the idea of there maybe being a shared space where we could do some updating on a regular basis. So it doesn't have to be such a big lift for any one person. Um, the same as surveying ourselves over and over. Um, that's hard also as we are a saturated small program asking again and again to answer these questions. So um, yeah, I don't know, uh, Ricky, I don't know if you want me to publicly ask you this, but here we are and it's recording. Since the SACS webinars live on the Pi Center website, mm -hmm. would it be possible to have a page where we were I mean, able I'll jump in and say, personally, I'd love to see this on the ACE website. Oh, uh, Ricky could also make that happen as current ACE president. <laughs> really, you're the answer to all the questions. Well, and the NACS website is getting a facelift, so it could live there. Yeah, yeah. Ricky can also This actually that. gets to the problem that we have here is that we have a bunch of different homes and we don't all go to all those different homes. Uh, like, I think that becomes the big complication, like. Jack is the closest thing to a home base, but like who wants to go to a journal website? Like, and you also, you wouldn't be able to update the journal articles. And it's, but like the Jeff yeah. Miller study, then that's, that's where it lives. And like, that's its best home right now. I wonder if Courtney and Erica could get um, maybe the, like this map with programs on the AgCom CDE uh, hosting site for oh. the Bay. Then it could also be a recruitment tool. Yeah, because it is career development at the high school level. And then you go train for that career at one of these locations. So. And to be clear, he means Courtney Gibson. 
Yes, Courtney Gibson. Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm on that team too, but they're, yeah. Courtney, yeah. I never have that problem. I will say that I've gotten uh, uh, one of our professional, uh, you actually should have gotten an email from her uh, uh, through me uh, about a week or so ago. And she has a long list of programs, either as minors or as, that I didn't even, wasn't even aware of. So I, I think that even within our own context here of those who are on the SACS list, uh, we're missing some folks too. And that's one of the things I'm going to work on over the summer. Kelsey's nodding her head. Uh, but I mean, there's several universities and colleges that have, again, either an ag comm option or minor or something along those lines that we have really not reached out to, or we may not even be aware of. So I was glad to get this list and yeah. it, uh, from the University of Nevada is one of those and um, others too. So Anyway, so it, I, I think that if we do this, or so whoever does this again, we have a lot more institutions that we would need to in, want to include with something along those lines. And Ricky, if I could add that, Courtney is with uh, ACN in the Future Ag Communicators Committee. And what they're seeing is what the future of their programming and mentoring will look like for internships and for the scholarships and whether or not they should require involvement in a student organization like the National ACT for consideration. And they sent Dr. Miller and I a very impressive Excel spreadsheet of every college in the country that has identified a certificate, an associate, a master's. Uh, bachelor's, master's degree. And I do believe that list was almost 50, uh, 55 or 57 like schools. And since then, I have had seven phone calls about national ACT and establishing chapters because some several of those schools did not have a connection yet and are desiring that and wanting to find out other programs. And so University of Mount Olive in North Carolina and Wilmington College in Ohio and just a lot of small programs that exist with bachelor's degrees, but have not thought of themselves maybe as agricultural communications are reaching out now. Yeah, thank you. An exciting time. I keep telling folks that too in our discipline to see the growth and continued growth to the point that we are not even sure among ourselves on this call of some of these that are out there. At least, at least I was not. So I think that goes back to somebody's question about why is this important. I think we just answered that question. I mean, to what you're talking about here in your research and moving beyond this, it's important because as we start and continue new bachelor's programs and master's programs and hopefully more and more PhD programs. We have to have at least some, to me, some consistency of at least effort or thought or, you know, research or how approach um, as we build even more and more programs. We see more and more programs being built. And then I just killed the conversation. I didn't mean to. That's all right. Well, I'm a wet blanket, like I said. Other comments or questions? Hi. Uh, I also always wonder about things like this. It's not always what do we need right now, too. Like a lot of this research, sometimes we do about what do we think we need right now, which is important, but it's also what do we need in three to five years from now for a program like this or five to 10 years from now? So uh, some future things might be also asking beyond some of the current skills or current theories or current needs, what do we also see as on the horizon for uh, a program like this to prepare people for what we know are going to be some of the future skills and future jobs and future research contexts that they're going to be working in or future projects they need to be able to develop or um, stakeholders they need to be able to work with and things like that. So not just reacting to what we think 
people tell us and our programs that's going to be needed, but we're the experts as well. Like we also need to be able to project and tell everyone else what we think is coming as well for the work that we do. So I think it'd be really cool for our discipline to potentially put out projections as well. Not always just kind of conducting assessments, but also put out projections for where we believe things are headed and sort of forecast things to kind of drive people uh, different directions as well, that where we see there's going to be things that need to happen and not just always reacting, but also thinking ahead to what should be coming as well. Great comment. Thank you, Jamie. Other questions or comments? Going once. Oh, Jamie, go ahead. Sorry. Um, something that we struggle with uh, when we're talking about a master's program is um how whether it is viewed as a professional degree, i.e., a degree that someone is seeking to enhance their professional opportunities, or a academic progress degree. Um, and as we consider our PhD program and where we're going to recruit from for PhD, that's also something we consider is 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 the person's master's degree has it been designed based on uh, either of those tracks. I guess, I guess that's something that we're, with our own master program, we pretty much settled that it is a professional degree. Most people do are doing it to advance their professional careers and aren't necessarily seeking an academic career, but other in other places we know for sure, it's kind of the opposite. People are doing it because they are, they do want to get into academia, so. I'm wondering if there's differences between what's offered based on those outcomes. I think some of that comes down to individual faculty members' perspectives. Um, and I know this is me saying something without any data whatsoever. This is purely an opinion. But I think if you have a master's or a PhD that's only preparing someone for academia and it has no transferable professional skills, then you're probably not doing that good job of preparing them to be in academia because the whole goal is that you are then going to be preparing people to go into professional skills and programs. So like, yeah, there are some things that are going to be specific to going into academia, but at least I like to think we have transferable skills that we're engaging in that we have things that we can do in other places as well. So, but yeah, even within the same programs, you'll see a little bit of different emphasis. Like, like tech, we've got a thesis and if a non-thesis option, and one of them is going to be more course heavy. One of them is students who that they know that they have no interest in getting a PhD down the line. But what I tell students when they're like considering it is if you think there's even this little teeny tiny chance that you're going to get a PhD down the line, highly recommend you do a thesis. Here's why. And then they'll make the choice from there. But like I you do see a little bit of a difference of approach. And in some of the open ended comments, we did see some of that where you would where people were like, our program is really meant for like sending people into industry or so we're not really going to be as focused on research. And so I think that some of it is to avoid the whole ivory tower thing. We need to look at like, we're an applied discipline. I feel like our research should be applicable to going back into industry. Like I still get feedback and comments from past grad students of they are using things that would be 100% transferable to a PhD, but they're now using it or whatever agency they work for, or doing surveys of employees, of customers, because that is still the same skill set, just a slightly different application. And I'll, I'll jump in and say our PhD program, we have one PhD program, you know, so we have these two master's degrees, or, and people can obviously come from all over. And I find um, as the graduate studies coordinator that many people who are applying for more of our um, agricultural education focused emphasis in the PhD program may have not done a thesis in their master's program because they did a creative component, they were working full time, they designed curriculum, they did other things. So we, 
I guess we have kind of the philosophy that it doesn't matter if they did a thesis or not at the master's level, as long as they've demonstrated other um, tangible skills or transferable skills that will help them excel. Um, at least that's the approach we've taken. Anyone else like to discuss that? Okay, any other comments from our presenters before we transition? Well, just to say thank you for letting us do this and we'll um, try to answer as many of these questions as we can, or we will have a long section related to questions unanswered, but other people should look at these so we don't lose our discussion today. And just appreciate Great. it. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all for your your comments, your presentation, and thank you all for your questions and also your comments related to the presentation today. At this time, uh, we do have a little bit of time uh, to, if there's anything that folks would like to, to discuss, I just want to remind everybody before anyone else wants to jump in, that we have several of our upcoming uh, professional meetings within the next month and a half or two months or so with, with one in April, AIAE, we have AAAE in May, we have ACE in June and NACTA in June, and I don't know how many others in June, but those are the ones that kind of can come to mind. So I would encourage you, if you've not been to one of these uh, uh, programs, uh, meetings, conferences before, or if you've gone to one and haven't tried something else but to, to try a different com a conference. If you can go to multiple conferences, I think that you'll enjoy all of them. They're in great locations uh, this time around. And so you, know, you can also see a different part of the country than you're normally go to. So again, I encourage you all to, to go to as many as you can. So with that, any comments or questions folks have? Anything that you want to share with the group? Shame pro issue assistantships. Uh, we were counting in our uh, faculty meeting today. We should have about up to 14 assistantships that start in the fall that aren't filled, like already have one or two that are filled, but up to 14 that are going to be available for students. And um, yeah, Oklahoma State, Stillwater, turns out it does rain here. So all the stereotypes of Oklahoma don't necessarily apply, but still windy. Hmm. Hey, so say that. So you have 14 possible assistantships so we are we're a little bit unique and a lot of our assistantships are actually outside of our department so we do have some of the traditional ones that are inside the department but um, we've got four that are downstairs with the student success center one with the ag comp services unit um, that is like the, the service unit not ours that works for the college uh, possibly two that are going to be with our food and ag product center those that haven't been finalized yet one with the grad college um, and then we're looking for a handful of teaching assistantships like we are every year um, but basically we just know that we have a lot that are going to be available for students and we do a full tuition waiver for in-state and out-of-state students so good opportunities it's just kind of one of those it's it's a good problem like we tend to have more assistantships than we can fill with students so it's mm. much much rather you, have the other way around do you have a rolling deadline Kisto, or like because if students uh, haven't applied yet could they still apply so no. Yeah, they can still apply. We do rolling admissions. Um, don't do this, but we've had students apply as late as August to start in August. Um, please don't do that. Um, but we don't have any rolling deadlines. Like we have people, and because of that, we don't necessarily always have, like we don't, if in some ways we don't always know what our pool looks like because we'll have folks kind of trickling in. And so we know that we've got a handful of folks that are still going to trickle in. It's just, even with all of them, we know that there are still going to, this is just, you know, you know, it cycles some years, you just have more. This is one of those years. So have you noticed your applications have gone up or are they holding? Because I'll just be honest, we have way more people applying than we can fill, than we, we can accept. I'd say we're probably not quite as high as we were the year before, but it's still, it's not, it's not really that low. It's just, it might be a little low, but not 14 empty assistantships. Like, it's just, some things have cycled through where just a whole bunch of them became available all at once. So, 
And okay, I'll, keep, I'll keep encouraging some of ours who are looking elsewhere um, to get their apps in. I know one I know one student has applied there and has met with Dwayne. So I hope that you all can get her. She's a good one. Well, I'm also noticing, Courtney, that students are thinking about grad school way earlier. So like we've got I had a sophomore in my office the other day sitting down and talking to me about graduate school. Um, so that I think is super interesting. So some of like the students I'm most excited about that we've had visit lately are juniors. So we're just kind of holding tight on some of that. And I say that like I've been doing this a really long time, but you know. <laughs> I am, I have something else. Sure. Well, ahead, people are here. Um, so I think to Ricky in our last meeting that, um, I started a graduate uh, leadership communication class this semester and it's all online. And um, as a kind of an experiment, I gave seven of the students Oculus Quest 2 headsets. And we had four graduate seminars throughout the semester uh, done in Horizon uh, workrooms. I don't know if anyone's done any of that. Um, so we had an invited guest who I trained to get in the workroom and they led the seminar and then everyone else participated as students um, and we did that four times um, and I'd love to expand that to other places and see and maybe do some I didn't do pre or post test I've just I've done interviews with students to get their perceptions as like a pilot this semester um, but it was the Quest headsets were like $300 a piece. We mailed them out to the students and trained them on how to access the seminars online. And uh, they really enjoyed it. It felt like they were more immersed in the content, um, felt more connected to the class and their, and their students. So I'll be at AIAEE and AAAE and ACE. If anyone is interested in expanding this, it'd be cool to do it at multiple institutions and maybe do a larger study about, about the impact of it. Okay, very cool. So if you're interested or know someone who is, please get with Jamie about this. Any other announcements or suggestions, recommendations? All right, if not, my last announcement is this, is that, uh, Today's the 27th, April 24th, April 24th. Kelsey here will be talking to the group about how to model mentoring and build relationships across race, ethnicity, and gender. So that will be our last uh, webinar presentation of the 2022-23. I know, crazy academic year. We're almost to that point. Um, and then uh, for those of you who are doing AIAE, you go from there, the webinar next day or so to to guelph so there you go so looking forward to it kelty thank you so much for being our presenter in april and uh, one thing i will say is um sometime either right before the end of the semester or right after the semester ends i would like to do kind of maybe a quick survey of everybody who's on the sites list and to see what topics people are interested in the last couple of years we've kind of let it open to anyone who has a, a topic or or uh, that they'd like to present but if you for those of you who've been here for a long time remember the very first year we we tried to target the presentations based on what we as collectively had said you know i'm really interested in blank and so i think i want to go ahead and do that again this time around and get uh maybe a, a pretty good synthesis of where we want to be, what we want to learn in the fall semester, if we would like to continue these too. So that's another question we'll have. Do we want to continue these? Um, so I'll, I, I will share my thoughts about that. I, I enjoy these. I enjoy getting, seeing everybody and hearing, but you know, as we know, we only have so many hours in the day. So again, thank you all. I'm not going to hold you off for for any longer have a great monday afternoon hope to see many of you at conferences coming up and then before that to see uh kelsey and all of us again next month on april 24th thank you bye-bye